turn your attention today at the very beginning of this chapter, a verse that we looked at last week that's really going to inform uh, and give us understanding of what God's Word is saying to us this week. And it really comes in verses 1 and 2. Today we're looking at the mind set on the Spirit, but it's a specific type of Spirit. You know, in the Bible, God tells us to test the spirits, right? Uh, Paul, in the book of 1 Corinthians, says that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God, except by the Holy Spirit. And so all throughout the Bible, there's this idea of not, it's not just about being a spiritual person, but it's, it's about, the Christian life is about belonging to Christ through His Spirit. Belonging to God through the Spirit of Christ. So it's not, it's not about being religious. It's not about being spiritual. You may know very spiritual people in your life. Uh, you might be the spiritual person that everybody knows to be spiritual. Um, but the Bible uh, is very clear in wanting us to, and God is wanting us to understand that though there are many spirits, There's only one spirit that saves. There's only one spirit that directs us in the way that God wants us to be directed. And it's the Holy Spirit. Now in chapter 8 of Romans, we learn how Paul describes the spirit in this passage. Now remember verse 1. What a great verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a promise. There is now, therefore, no condemnation. Why does he stress this word now? Because you and I, when we talk to other human beings, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, when we go to work, when we parent our children, or or whatever it is that, that you do in your stage of life, it is a constant reminder every day that we are sinners. The thoughts that I have, The words that come out of my mouth, the way that I treat other people, the goals that I have, the accomplishments that I give myself a hand for, all that stuff are reminders that I am a sinner. I am at my core a self-centered person. I think about myself more than I do other people. This is what I do in my flesh. But Paul makes a distinction between the flesh and the spirit in chapter 7. And when we come to chapter 8, verse 1, he says that because of Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross for me in my place, because he paid sin's death penalty for me, I can live today in the flesh and still know that I'm a sinner, but still have everlasting life through Jesus Christ, through faith in him. So Paul says, it's not as though we're just looking for like someday when there will be no condemnation for us. But he says, no, it's now. Through faith in Christ, now there's no condemnation for you. There's a great freedom in that. Verse 2, he says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that's the the spirit that we're going to be talking about today, not just any spirit, but the spirit of life in Christ Jesus He said, has set you free from the law of sin and of death. So because of what Jesus has done for you, for every believer, in time and space, in history, Jesus came to earth. He physically suffered. He physically died. He was risen physically from the dead. Because of what he did in time and space, you can be, some of you have been set free from sin and death because of your faith in him. Now, but the Christian life continues, doesn't it? We continue walking, as he says, or operating or living life. So when we come to verse 5, we're going to read verses 5 through 11. And then we're going to discover all the amazing things that God has for us in the gospel. Starting in verse 5, he says, For those who are according to the flesh... Set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, 
But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Let's pray for a moment. Father, as we begin to open up your word, Lord, and to hear your voice as we read these words, God, would your spirit move in our hearts and our minds? God, would you transform us again? And God, above everything else this morning, we would catch a glimpse again of your son Jesus dying on the cross for us in our place, paying our sin penalty, being our substitute, And taking all of our sin upon himself so that we might be free from the law of sin and death. Even right now where we stand. And God that that grace and that truth would motivate us. To stop looking introspectively at ourselves. That we would constantly cast our eyes upon Christ. And that our faith would be nourished upon him. We ask it in Jesus name. Amen. We're going to look at four things this morning. And in uh, typical, I guess some people would call it Baptist fashion, um, almost all of these major words in these points start with the same letter. If you're like me, that's never helped you remember anything. But it just so happens sometimes it works out. Sometimes it works out that way. If we look at verse 5, He says, those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. When he says are according to, in my copy, it's the New American Standard, I believe he's referring to this idea of walking, this idea of living. Walking according to the flesh, walking according to the spirit. So if you're walking according to the flesh, he would say you are according to the flesh. You're operating according to the flesh. If you're walking according to the spirit, you are operating. Walking, operating according to the Spirit. But he's going to compare these two things throughout this passage. But the first thing that we notice in verses 6 through 7 is the association of the mindset on the Spirit of life in Christ. Now, he doesn't repeat that phrase, the Spirit of life in Christ, but when he talks about the Spirit in verses 6 through 11, that's what he's talking about. Verse 6, for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. What spirit? What spirit is he talking to? He's talking about the spirit of life in Christ. We go back to chapter 7. He says, though I live in the flesh, this is, I look at God's law and I, I see that I don't measure up. So how is it? He says, wretched man that I am. He says, I, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the, the one... wishing to do good things. But he's like, I acknowledge I have a weakness. I have a weakness, it's my flesh. So how is it that God can, how is it that I can be in right relationship with God? And then at the very end of chapter seven, he says, thanks be to God because it's through Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual truth. It's a real event that Jesus died for me on the cross, but it's this spiritual truth that Jesus has defeated sin and death and the grave And that he died for me. And my faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ frees me from the penalty of my own sin. But we first notice what he says in verse 6 through 7. The association of the mindset on the spirit and life of Christ. 
Now, he contrasts these again, verse 6. The mind set on the flesh is death. The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Notice what he does there in verse 6. He adds something extra. Do you see it? In your copy of the scriptures there in verse 6, the mind set on the flesh is death. One thing, right? Mind set on flesh equals death. But then he says, the mind set on the spirit is life and what else? Peace. Is life and peace. Why? Because he wants you, he wants every believer to know that you can have peace in this life. You don't have to wait for it. It's not put off. God doesn't put it off for eternity. You can have peace in this life. So he contrasts this idea of peace and hostility. Look at verse 7. He says, because the mindset on flesh is what? Hostile toward God. Most of the places that that Greek word that's translated hostile here, most of the times that pops up in the New Testament is translated as enemy or enmity at variance with. So notice what he says. He says, the mindset on the flesh is death, or, sorry, verse seven, because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Hostility versus peace. See, we, we like to tend to think that, that before or until someone becomes a, a follower of Jesus Christ, and before someone is regenerated in their heart and their lives are changed, they are just passively in the middle somewhere. Kind of riding the fence. They're neither here nor there. They, they really don't have a dog in the fight. They're, they're very unbiased when it comes to spiritual things. And, and they could decide on a whim whether or not they're going to follow Jesus or not. It's not that big of a deal. But that's not what God says in his word. He, he says the mindset on the flesh, there are only two options here, the mindset on the flesh, on self, on I can do this on my own. The mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit of life in Christ is life and peace. But the mindset on the flesh, he says, there's a problem with it. It is hostile toward God. Have you ever had someone who was hostile toward you? Have you ever been in a road rage incident? Hopefully you weren't on the hostile end of that, but sometimes it happens. I've heard it can happen. I'm guilty of that too. Hostile, what does it mean when someone is hostile toward you? Another, another way this word is, is translated in the New Testament is hatred. Have you ever known someone who hates you? Like they hate you. One of, the, one of the worst things I've experienced in life is, is experiencing people who hate you and you don't know why. You know what I'm talking about? It's just so frustrating. They have this hatred, this hostility toward you, and you don't even know why. The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. Throughout Scripture, sinners are described as enemies of the cross, Lovers of themselves, people whose God is their appetite, the things that they crave, the things that they desire in the flesh, that's their God. That kind of heart, that kind of flesh is hostile toward God. It is resistant toward God. And until God does a work in someone's heart, they're not receptive to him. And we can fool ourselves by thinking they can choose at any time. Anyone can change their heart. But Paul says, when we come face to face with God's character in his law, when he shows us who he is, we're powerless to change. Matter of fact, Paul comes to that conclusion. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? Because he knows he can't deliver himself. That there is this sense of false peace that is peddled today. And it's a huge letdown. And if it's not in this life, it will definitely be a letdown in the life to come. There are times in history where a false sense of peace was felt. It happened in 1938, just about two months from now. Or, uh, 
actually this month, September 30th, 1938, in Great Britain, Neville Chamberlain signed a peace pact with the Nazi party. 1938, if you know your World War II history, uh, that's a little early for any kind of peace pact, right? He was praised in the streets of Great Britain as a national hero. Christopher Klein writes, On a rainy day, an autumn evening, thousands awaited the Prime Minister's return at London's Heston Aerodrome. And the thankful crowd cheered wildly as the door to his British Airways plane opened. As raindrops fell on Chamberlain's silver hair, he stepped onto the airport tarmac. He held aloft the non-aggression pact that had been inked by him and Adolf Hitler only hours before, and the flimsy piece of paper flapped in the breeze. The Prime Minister read to the nation the brief agreement that reaffirmed the desire of our two peoples, quote, never to go to war with one another again. Summoned to Buckingham Palace to give a first-hand report to King George VI, Chamberlain was cheered on by thousands who lined the five-mile route from the airport. As the rain poured, thousands flooded the plaza in front of the royal residence. As if it were a coronation of a royal wedding, the frenzied cheers brought forth the king and queen along with Chamberlain and his wife onto the palace balcony. In an unprecedented move, the smiling king motioned the prime minister to step forward and receive the crowd's adulation as he receded into the background to leave the stage solely to a commoner. After his royal audience, Chamberlain returned to his official residence at number 10 Downing Street. There, a jubilant crowd shouted, Good old Neville! And sang, For he's a jolly good fellow. From a second floor window, Chamberlain addressed the crowd and invoked Prime Minister Biz Benjamin Disraeli's famous statement upon returning home from the Berlin Congress of 1878. Quote, My good friends, this is the second time in our history that there has come back from Germany to Downing Street peace with honor. I believe it is peace for our time. Then he added, quote, Now I recommend you go home and sleep quietly in your beds. Klein writes, As Britain slept, the German army marched into Czechoslovakia in peaceful conquest, quote, unquote, of the Sudetenland. The bombers did not roar over London that night, but they would come. In March 1939, Hitler annexed the rest of Czechoslovakia, and two days after the Nazis crossed into Poland on September the 1st, 1939, the Prime Minister again spoke to the nation, but this time to solemnly call for a British declaration of war against Germany and the launch of World War II. Before that, in World War I, actually four days before the actual Armistice Day, November 7th, 1918, there was a mixed message that came through the wire to the U.S. saying that Germany had surrendered. All of New York City erupted in celebration four days before it actually happened. $85,000 was spent on celebrations in New York City just for the cleanup of the premature celebration. By the time Armistice Day actually happened, four days after the fact, the celebrators in New York City were already done. It kind of lost interest. See, these are not the only instances throughout world history where peace was celebrated either prematurely or it was celebrated falsely. But it happens all the time now when people falsely assume that they're in good with God without having the peace that only the spirit of life in Christ brings there's an old bumper sticker I used to see all the time it's probably made into a t-shirt it says no Jesus N-O Jesus comma I'm sorry yeah N-O Jesus N-O peace no Jesus no peace then underneath that K-N-O-W Jesus K-N-O-W, peace. Apart from knowing Jesus, there is no real peace and your association and my association, everyone's association with God, if not peace through only Christ Jesus is, the Bible says, hostility. 
We're not on the fence. We're enemies of God if we're not at peace with God through Jesus. Number two, not only the association, but we also see the attitude of the mindset on the spirit of life in Christ. The attitude of the mindset. Verse 7. He says, The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not, what? Subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. The mindset on the flesh is not able to submit itself voluntarily to the authority of God. It is not able to do that. The law of God, as he reveals himself and his character through the law, does not create in us a willingness. It does not create in us an ability or a passion to do the things of God, to submit ourselves to God. It has to come through the person and work of Jesus on the cross. But if you're a Christian, you have a new attitude. If you're a follower of Jesus who understands what he did for you at Calvary's cross, you have a new disposition. You have a new attitude. It is one not of pride, not of hostility, not of I'm calling the shots. It's one of humility. It's one of bowing low before the King of kings and Lord of lords who took your sin upon himself and nailed it to the cross. It's one of humility. What else can we do when we see him for who he is? He gives us a new heart. He gives us a new attitude. One of submission. We are, the Bible calls us followers. We are servants. We are emptied. We are exhausted. If you remember the story of the woman who came and and took that costly vial of perfume, all of her life savings, and broke it and, and washed Jesus' feet with it and anointed him with it broken and spilled out, emptied out for him, humbly at his feet, washing his dirty feet. That's the new attitude. It's the attitude of the mindset on the spirit of life in Christ. Completely different than that of the flesh. In Philippians chapter 2, one of my favorite passages, I say that about many of them, I'm sure, but What a reminder it is for me when I forget who I am. When I forget what he's done for me. Paul charges the church here in Philippi. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation in love, of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, If any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. While running the risk of preaching an entirely different sermon, I want you just to note, notice a few things from this passage. When he talks about Jesus, he says, have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. He's making connection there. 
He says, you are claiming to be followers of Christ. You are members of his church. If that is the case, have the same attitude in yourselves as he had for you to make you who you are today. He existed in the form of God. But he did not regard equality with God something to be seized. Something that was rightfully his. See, that's what we do in in personal relationships. We want to take what is rightfully ours and hold on to it and guard it and protect it from other people. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus had something he could have seized. He could have called, he could have summoned thousands of angels to rescue him from Calvary. He did not have to do that, but he did it. Paul even says, even a death on a cross. Why does he say even? Because death on a cross was the most humiliating thing imaginable. You were the lowest of the low. He was crucified as someone who was the lowest of all criminals. And he did it so you could have salvation. Completely different mindset. J.C. Ryle once wrote, the truest mark of conversion is humility. The truest mark of conversion is humility. John Trapp once wrote, the less a person strives for himself, the more God will be his champion. A new attitude, a new mindset. Thirdly, we see a new aptitude. The aptitude of the mindset on the spirit of the life in Christ, starting in verse 8. You're not going to believe this. In verse 8, he says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now the first thing that he, that he shows us is this glorious truth that you and I can please God. You know that? You can please God. Now, those who are in the flesh, verse 8 says, cannot please God. In the same way that those in the flesh cannot subject themselves to God, they can also not ever please God. So for those who would say, I don't need Jesus, I don't need the gospel, I don't need Christianity, someday I'm going to appear before God and he's going to look at me and the good things that I've done, he's going to compare me to a lot of the hypocrites that I see in the church, and he's going to say, I would rather have you on my team than, th- than them. That's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. Those who are in the flesh cannot Please, God. Apart from Christ, it is impossible to please God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he uses the same type of language, writing to a different church. And particularly, he has in mind the, uh, the Judaizers, those who come from a Jewish background, who are very legalistic. He says something that would very much offend them. And that is, you do not please God. Imagine how offensive that is to people who took pride in how much more pleasing to God they are than everybody else. He says in verse 14, this is in 1 Thessalonians 2, For you, brethren, talking to the church, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but what? Hostile. There's that word again. Hostile to all men. They're not only not pleasing the Lord, they are hostile to the Lord's people, to Christians. Same language he uses there, hostility and pleasure. It is impossible to please God in the flesh. 
because we're hostile. We in our flesh reject Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, he talks about as Christians who are awaiting the day of our resurrection, he says we still have, we still have the same ambition. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, what does he mean there? At home, in the body, here, or absent from the body. We still have the same ambition. Why? Because both our minds and body, the flesh and spirit in a Christian still yearn for the things of Christ. He says, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. We want to please Him, don't we? Followers of Christ want to be pleasing to God. We want to please Him. But here's the truth. Because of Jesus' identity, because of who He is, and because of what He did on the cross, through faith in Him and through faith alone, not of works, but through faith in Him alone, you are pleasing to God. When He looks upon you, He sees His Son, Jesus, and He's pleased. You can please him in your walk with Christ. He says that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10. He says that as Christians, we should always be, he says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So it's not just a one and done, but it's a lifestyle. It's a process. I am pleasing to the Lord. I am pleasing to God because when he looks at me, he sees Jesus because of my faith in him, because of what Christ has done for me. But I also, I also follow Christ trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. But the mind set on the flesh can never please God. It will never please God. This is the difference that the person and work of Jesus Christ makes in our life. And then finally, we see the outcome. Now, before we jump into that part, I just want to, I don't want to skip over verses 9 through 10. I want you to notice something. In verse 9, he says, you, talking to the church, he says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Okay, so we have the Spirit, but he's saying this is the Spirit of God. The one God. The one true God. But then he says, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. He does not belong to God. Okay, so I was very clear here. There's, there's not more than one path to God. There's not more than one path to the Father. It's through His Son, Jesus Christ, only. Because He says, you do not belong to God if you do not have the Spirit of Christ. Folks, the Gospel is all about Jesus. It's all about Him. It's all about who He is. It's all about what He's done for you, for me. Verse 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now don't mistake what he means here. We've already come across that word righteousness several times in Romans, haven't we? Romans 1, 16 and 17. Not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness he's talking about has not changed hands, folks. It is still the righteousness of God. We are saved by his righteousness, not our own. We have none. We have no righteousness. So how is it that we can be seen as righteous in God's sight? It's through what God has done 
for us in Christ. Christ is the righteous one. And then finally, verse 11. The outcome of the mindset on the spirit of life in Christ. What does all this lead to? Oh, I love this. This is just kind of a crescendo. Verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What happened to Jesus after he died? He was buried and then what? He arose. He was resurrected. He lives. Amen? And this is the hope that we have. Yes, we can be pleasing to him now. Yes, we can have life now. Yes, we can be submitted to him now. But there is a great homecoming awaiting us. A great resurrection. There will no longer be any struggle with the flesh. There will be no longer any battling. The battle will be over. He will be victorious over sin and death and the grave. The Bible says he will wipe away every tear. He will take away every pain. He will heal every wound. And Paul's reasoning is this. If the spirit of him, that is of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, if he dwells in you, then you have a resurrection to look forward to. He will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. But a mind that is set on the flesh has no resurrection, has no eternal afterlife in God's presence to look forward to. Instead, it faces judgment. In Christ, brothers and sisters, you can have peace. A peace that the New Testament says passes all understanding, all comprehension. It won't make sense to the human mind. It doesn't make sense to the human mind, to the fleshly mind. It's foolishness, the gospel is, Paul says. It's a scandal. By the power of the Spirit, the Bible says to everyone who, to everyone who accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior and who receives the Spirit of the risen Christ, we have these promises. In Christ, you can be humble, a servant with a purpose. In Christ, you can be pleasing to God, clothed in Christ's righteousness. The Father can look at you with pleasure and say, this is my beloved child. He or she is mine. In Christ, you can have everlasting life. Your mortal body will be raised on the last day. It'll be glorified and fit for eternity with Jesus, our Savior King. The mindset on the Spirit has all of these things. The mindset on the flesh has none of them. It is hostile toward God, an enemy of the cross, a slave to its own passions and purposes. The mindset on the flesh often lulls itself into a false sense of peace biding its time until death where it is then confronted with the foolishness and pride of its life. And by then it is too late. The time to believe in Jesus is now. It's today. The time to trust Him to save you is at this moment. Come to the end of yourself. Surrender your life to Christ. He will save you. And He promises to transform you. Do you bow your heads? I'm going to pray for you. And then Mike is going to come in a moment and read uh, our benediction and, and dismiss us today.
Father, impress upon us this morning. Lord, if there is any doubt in our hearts, any doubts in our mind, that the road of self-centered, I can do it on my own, flesh, fleshly mind, Lord, impress upon us that there is no hope in that mindset. There is no life. There is no peace. There is no following Jesus with that mindset. There is no compromise. Father, that you call everyone to repent. You call everyone to trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Believing in Him and in what He has done for us at the cross. And that that spirit of the life in Christ, that resurrection life, is the only way that we can have peace with you. It's the only way that our hearts will bow to you and be humble to you. It's the only way that we can have peace and be submitted and serve. And it's the only way that we have life eternal. It's the only way that we can escape damnation and judgment. Is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who has that false sense of peace, God, that you would remove uh, every deception upon their heart and mind and that they would call out to you, save me in this moment. And God, I know that you will. You tell us, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, for others in this room that just need to be encouraged that in your son Jesus and simple faith in him, faith alone in him, we can be pleasing to you that we're clothed in your righteousness and that we're your children. And that no matter what every or anyone else in this world says about us, Lord, we know that we belong to you. That we're one of your beloved. Let us be encouraged by this message this morning and challenged as well. We turn our eyes upon you.